Well, hey, everybody, welcome. Whether you're joining us online or here in the room, we're so glad that you're here. We are finishing a two-week series that we've called Screen Time uh, around how we relate to and use our technology in hopes that it doesn't use us, in hopes that our devices don't become our vices. And we started talking about it last week, and I'd really encourage you, if you haven't seen that one, and like this is the first one you're at, I'm about to get in your business, and you're gonna be like, why are you doing this? I kind of answered it like last week. So check it out. If you're watching online, just stop watching now. Go watch that one. It's fine. Uh, tell them I told you it's okay. Um, but I hope that for all of us, we can understand this to be a conversation. I grew up in 90s youth group culture. We are not going to do like the bonfire afterwards where we throw our cell phones in it with our secular CDs. I promise. Uh, this is not about how we get rid of technology. I am thankful for technology. This is how about how we are intentional with it. And I'll finish today with a list of ways for us to think about technology and win with technology individually. And then a list, if you're a parent, uh, for how you can win with technology as a parent. So, uh, but before we get started, I'm gonna pray for us. If you've never been here before, never heard me speak, I pray kneeling. And the reason that I do that is because I hope it's not me getting in your business. I hope it's God. And uh, I wanna position all of us to be able to hear from him directly. Would you pray with me? God, thank you. Thank you that our lives right now, while they're not exactly what you want them to be, that God, you haven't given up on us. You haven't walked away. Would you help us to hear you today? Would you help us to push away the distractions and embrace some discomfort to be able to hear and listen and respond? We love you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, the goal, right, is not how do we experience guilt or shame? How do we drop new rules? That's not what this is. This is an invitation uh, with grace to be able to think and understand what God has for us as it relates to technology. With that in mind, I asked you this question in the pre-service show and um, hopefully you answered it maybe either in the app, if you're in the room or online, wherever you're watching. I asked you this question, uh, what is the best tool you have at home? Some of you answered online. Amanda said, uh, my husband, if I can't do it, he can. That's, uh, I don't know how he feels about that answer, but that's very sweet. Uh, Pete said, mine is my Dremel. Uh, so many different uses. I've used a Dremel tool before. Uh, and Catherine said, my mom swears by her Instant Pot, uh, but I still love a good old fashioned crock pot, right? An Instant Pot is like its own thing for sure. So all of us understand some stuff about tools, whether you think about tools in the kitchen or you're thinking about tools in the garage or somewhere in between, we can recognize uh, that kind of the more elaborate the tool, the more care and thoughtfulness we bring to how we use it, right? So if you think about like a screwdriver, I would give this to just about anybody. I mean, I wouldn't give it to my one-year-old because he'd probably stab me with it, but like other than that, it's probably a pretty big group of people that could use effectively a screwdriver. If I think about a step up and I think about a drill, right, who could use this? It's a different list. Like, it's not going to be something that just anybody can use. And depending on how you're using it, there's some parameters you put with it. But when you think about a table saw, right, and you think about something that feels way more significant, when you think about a tool that's this big, and this heavy can do this much damage, there's like a whole bunch of things we do, right? Like we put on these goggles, uh, which, you know, really a fashion statement, I feel like, you know? And so you have goggles on and then you put on these ear things. Sorry, I didn't bring enough for all you guys. And then you put on gloves because apparently that's gonna protect the blade from hitting you. Um, and then once all of that's there, I get this like little stick so that I still have two hands at the end of this. And all of this is necessary to use a piece of equipment like this, right? And like, it's weird that I'm using a tool like this in church. I get that. But uh, you understand that when you use a tool like this, all of these precautions are necessary because the bigger the tool, the more potentially dangerous the tool, the more care we bring to the tool. So I want you to like think about this picture. I want you to think about the care and attention we bring to something like this. Now, uh, at the same time, we have four kids and uh, we are currently in a battle with one of our kids who really wants to bring toys to the dinner table. And he, can, he is convinced that he's not going to play with them at the dinner table. He just wants to have them there, right? And so we're like, hey, really appreciate you, bud, but like, we're gonna be present together. Like, we're not gonna bring toys to the dinner table. And it's like a thing for us so that we can be present together. But the more I thought about it and got ready for this time together, the more I realized like I bring a toy to the dinner table. Maybe you bring a toy to the dinner table. 
And, and the thing is, like, we view our technology when we're not careful very much as this toy of distraction. We talked about it last week. Instead of experiencing discomfort, we turn to distraction. And technology, when we're unintentional with it, can easily become that. But the thing is, like, actually our technology is way more powerful than that table saw is. And so how are we thinking about and understanding and relating to our technology more like that and less like this? And here's the thing, I know it's easier, especially as a parent, to parent with technology. Last week we talked about this idea that Jesus makes life better, but not always easier. Technology makes life easier, but not always better. And while that's the case for sure, like we're all feeling that, we're all kind of understanding that on some level, at the same time, right? We're trying to figure out at the end of what hopefully feels like this really crazy season and how have I needed technology to kind of just cope myself or as a parent, how do we give ourselves grace for what we need and give our kids grace for what they need? How do we understand this and relate to this? Well, I think at the core of it, what I'm gonna try to help you think about today is how you and I make technology more tool than toy. I think that if we can think about and understand and relate to all the technology in our life as more of a tool, it will change the way we approach and understand it. And and I think it can change it for the good. But there are a couple ways I want us to think about why that's the case or how we do that before I get to some really, really practical stuff. The first one is this, uh, boundaries are blessings. Boundaries are blessings. As a matter of fact, maybe you've never thought about it this way. Uh, Boundaries reveal how important the thing that is inside the boundary is. The the more intentional we are with the boundaries around something, the more valuable what is inside of those boundaries truly is. And so as we think about boundaries, right? Last week, we talked about the idea of gluttony. And we talked about from Ron Rollheiser in the book, Sacred Fire, how uh, technology is the new gluttony, that it's our endless appetite meeting endless access. And just constantly, we believe this lie that when more is the goal, if I can just get some more, it will be enough, but it will never be enough, right? And so, well, uh, gluttony, maybe when you and I make our appetite what's most true of us, what's most ultimate, can do that. It's actually not the only way that technology can kind of twist us. As a matter of fact, there's a pastor in New York City named Tim Keller. He says it this way. He says, true freedom isn't the absence of boundaries. It's the presence of the correct ones. Isn't that true that for us, we we live in a culture that takes independence and freedom and places it as high as we could possibly place it. But we know intuitively that that kind of freedom is not always safe, not always healthy. As a matter of fact, he uses a metaphor. He says, if you take a fish out of its tank and you set the fish on the table next to the tank, that fish has never been more free than it is in that moment. And it's going to die. As a matter of fact, when we talk about boundaries from God, we talk about this idea that when God says do, he means he designed you that way. And when God says don't, he means don't hurt yourself. It's understanding that God has given you and me boundaries. And how do we apply those boundaries to something as practical as technology? Because boundaries are a blessing, especially if we wanna think about technology as more tool than toy. Another quote comes from an author and a speaker, she's amazing, named Priscilla Shire. And she says, "Uh, anything that doesn't have a boundary around it is an idol. Now just like think about that for a minute, right? That is very uncomfortable. When we live in a culture where we binge watch things, where we experience things at our speed, in our way, with no parameters, how long are you gonna do that? How long are you gonna engage with that? How long are you gonna scroll? How long are you gonna play? Like the answer is just until I don't want to anymore. And how do you feel at the end of that? It is so easy for good things to be made ultimate. That's what idolatry is. I take good things and I make them ultimate. I make them little gods in my life. And what I don't realize is I've given them power and control. And with this, I think there are three ideas that are really important to know. One is that hearts bleed. We live in a culture that basically says uh, it's somebody else's fault. Like that's kind of the prevailing idea that whatever you're dealing with, whatever you're uncomfortable by, whatever's wrong in your life, it's somebody else's fault. But what the Bible says is that while there are extenuating factors, whether, while there is injustice, while there are things that we wanna see made right, at the core of it, our, the condition and quality of our life is actually most coming from our heart. There's a book in the Hebrew scriptures called the book of Proverbs uh, written by Solomon. And he gives these kind of uh, ideas of life. And in Proverbs 4.23, he says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. You know, when we think about this idea of how our heart works, 
You have to wonder, right, if the, the direction of your life, if what your life is producing isn't what you were hoping for, I'm just telling you a great place to look at why that is the case is in at your heart. And when you and I use technology in unintentional ways, we are not guarding our heart. We talked about this last week, that this idea of following Jesus means that we're transformed by the renewing of our mind, not conforming to the patterns of this world. And there are patterns. If you don't guard your heart, it's not like you were just kind of becoming passively engaged to a, a, a random thing of technology. You are letting yourself be manipulated by companies who are using the same tactics as 1940s Nazi Germany to manipulate you, to divide us so that they can make money and gain more power. It's a problem. We have to guard our hearts at an individual level. Second, friends steer. I used to say this a lot when I was a student pastor. I would say, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And students would push back. They would say, well, no, no, like my friends don't influence me like that. Yes, they do. They absolutely do. But it's not just the friends that we have in real life, right? It's not just how we influence somebody I get to see and interact with. It's how people that I interact with online influence me too. People who I look at a filter of a filter of a filter of their life and I go, I want that. And all of a sudden I'm, I'm starting to believe a lie and live towards a lie that has nothing to do with the life that God ultimately wants for me. Proverbs 13, 20 says, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. And so when you think about your social media feed or you think about uh, the news sources that you check out or you think about the shows that you watch and you think, oh no, it doesn't affect me like that. You think about the games that you play and you go, it doesn't affect me like that. Yes, it does. It absolutely does affect us that way. And understand that your life is in many ways being steered as you unintentionally let technology, let your heart guard down and you unintentionally let, maybe letting the wrong influences in to steer you and your heart that's been unintentionally redirected away from God and what he has for you. Again, we're not, it's not guilt, it's not shame. It's not put the technology in a bonfire. It's how do we be intentional with our technology so that it's more tool than toy. And then third, words pierce. We all grew up with a line that hopefully you know is not true. The line is this, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, right? That's not true. That's not accurate, right? Words hurt, they sting, they stick. And all of a sudden, this idea over time that we can just say what we want, we can just experience what others want to say to us and it doesn't affect us, it absolutely does. How does this relate to technology? Well, uh, Proverbs 10, 19 says, when words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. You know what Solomon is saying? He's saying, the more you talk, the more you're gonna hurt people with your words. And if I were to like play this forward into 2021, I think what Solomon is saying is post less. You're like, but how's everybody gonna know what I think about politics. How's everybody gonna know what I had for lunch? How's everybody gonna know everything about me that I communicate as true, but I've taken 10 pictures and taken the perfect one of the 10 and then put a filter on it and put it out there? They don't need to. We don't all need to know that about one another. And what we know is true is that our hearts that have wickedness in them are gonna consistently communicate things that are unintentionally hurtful. I'm not saying don't post. I'm not saying don't speak. I'm saying like so much of the rest of this with technology, it means that we speak, post, and comment with intentionality. It means we do it on purpose. That's how boundaries are blessings when we understand those things. That's how we can understand that our technology can be more tool than toy. Now, the second thing I wanna look at before we talk about those lists is how do you and I find rhythms of renewal? Rhythms that renew you and me so that at the end of that busy day, at the end of that difficult week, we go, oh, you know what? Like I can actually catch my breath. I actually do this thing, have this habit, and I feel better afterwards. It's not just a numbing behavior. It's something that actually restores me. There's a letter in the New Testament of the Bible that the apostle Paul wrote uh, called 1 Corinthians. He's writing to a Corinthian church that realizes for the first time culturally that in Jesus, they no longer have to follow all these laws to try to get to God. Hundreds of laws in the Hebrew scriptures. Paul is learning the same lesson as a newer Christian as he writes these letters to churches. And they're trying to figure out in Corinth how to do that without using their freedom as an excuse for sin. 
And Paul writes them this letter trying to help them understand how to use this freedom without abusing this freedom. And he says this in 1 Corinthians 6, 12, he says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. You know, what we see in this section of Corinthians is a phrase historians tell us, this idea of all things are lawful for me. It's like, a, it's like an idiom that they said in their culture. And we don't say that, like you don't walk around like all things are lawful for me. You're like, that would feel weird. But we do have a phrase like that. Our phrase is this, we say it's a free country, right? Because in our country, independence and freedom are the top goal. But here's the problem. If you're a follower of Jesus, your citizenship in heaven says that the highest goal is that you are dependent on God and interdependent with his people. It means that even though you and I are free, we don't use our freedom as an excuse for sin. And we will live in tension of the blessing of where God's placed us in this life and the responsibility for what it means to follow him. And Paul says, look, I'm not gonna use my freedom for stuff that's not helpful. Like, yeah, I can do whatever I want, but not everything is actually helping me. Not everything is actually benefiting you. And I'll just tell you, not everything you do on your phone, not everything you do on Netflix, not everything you do on your computer, not everything you do in technology that you can make really good excuses for, not everything you do is helpful. Is that a standard for you? About how you use your technology, about how you follow God. Is that the way you want your story of how you use technology to play out? And then he says, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. He's saying, you know what? I'm gonna let God be in charge because either God's in charge or something else is in charge. Sometimes we wanna take control. Sometimes when it's easy, we wanna give somebody else control. And I think sometimes it, we're totally okay with giving technology control and you're being conformed. You're being taken down a path in a world that's seeking to manipulate you more and more and more. And the very technology that you feel like is giving you freedom may be actually enslaving you. Last week, I challenged you to think about this. I said, uh, when you're bored, tired, or scared, choose God over gadgets. Choose God over gadgets. I asked you the question, how many, um, how many prayers since the smartphone has come out, how many prayers have not been offered? Because when we feel uncomfortable, when we feel bored, when we feel pain, when we feel sad, rather than turning to God, rather than having healthy conversations with real people, what do we do? We talked about last week this idea that scrolling is the new smoking, right? We get out of a meeting or you get out of a class and you're just like, oh yeah, this is good. I needed just some of this, you know? And you get to the end of it and you're like, oh, I feel so much better. No, you don't. No, you don't. You just feel like you got to hit pause. That's all that does. And so what does it look like for you and me to go like, what is the thing in my life that I need more, that you need more than an escape from? You need renewal within as a matter of fact, it's been a focus of our year. Uh, we talked about it this fall called cultivating life. What does it mean for you and me to cultivate life? See, for so many of us in the West, what we wanna do is we wanna find the perfect content, the perfect ideas that we get to take on or take in. And if we just have the right ones and everything else will be good. But Jesus teaches a parable where he talks about the condition of the human heart as different soils. And he talks about how important it is for you and me to understand that what's going on inside of me is actually the most relevant detail about whether or not I can grow spiritually or not. And we talked about one of the soils that Jesus mentions is called the thorny soil. I called it the crowded heart, the distracted heart. And the problem is that when you go to your garden and you start weeding and you remove things that would prevent depth of growth from going even deeper, here's the problem. If you've ever done this before, a month after you do it the first time, you have to do it again because the weeds have come back. They keep growing and technology can easily, when we approach it un unintentionally, it can easily be those weeds that grow in our heart. And we just think, oh, it's not a big deal. It's, it's no problem. I've got this taken care of. And maybe you think that, but I bet if you could see the picture of the kind of life Jesus wants you to have, you would realize like, oh, there's a pretty big gap here. What does it look like to let God in to deal with some of these distractions? Because any appetite that God has given you, he has given and provided a righteous way for that appetite to be satisfied. But what technology does is it says this endless appetite, some of which uh, you're trying to satisfy in unhealthy ways, meets endless access in technology. And again, we get to this place of digital gluttony where you are never satisfied. You never get to the end of a season and you're like, oh man, you know what? I'm just not gonna watch Netflix for a few months. No, no, you're like, hey guys, 
you know, this was like a joke. It was like a meme during COVID. We were all like, okay, so we finished Netflix. What's next? You know, it, it's constant in us. And so what does it look like for you and me to restore, to find rhythms of rest? We talk about it around here. We call them uh, these uh, rhythms of a better life. What does it mean for you to walk with God? It's not a checklist. Uh, it's an opportunity for you and me to start, start taking steps to follow Jesus. The first one we talk about is daily time with God whether that's praying or Bible study or worship or journaling, like what are the disciplines you do each day to spend time with God? And if you don't have any of them, try something. What does weekly time in worship look like? I know that this year it's looked a lot different, but whether you're here in the room or you're joining us online, prioritizing this experience matters. Regular time in community where you actually know people and they actually know you and they're trying to push you. You're trying to push them to follow Jesus better. What does that look like? having consistent investment in our key three, three people who are close to you physically, but far from the relationship that God died to provide, right? How are you praying for them, investing in them, inviting them into your life? We're not trying to convince them. We're not trying to manipulate them. We're just trying to have them see what God's doing in me. I'm trying to get to know other people. What does that look like for you? Ongoing habits of generosity and service so that at the end of the day, the generosity that God has shown to humankind by sending his son to die for us, to know him, that we don't just experience that as for us, but through us, other people can experience it too. And then lastly, we commit that whether we've been a Christian for a few days, a few years, or a few decades, that we are committed to unending change within. That as long as we're still here, God's still working on us. If we're not dead, we're not done. But last week I told you those weren't the only places we need to think about. Those aren't the only areas that God is, or that uh, technology, when we, when we use it unintentionally, is robbing us from what God has for us. Think, if you think about it physically, right, the question may be for you, are you getting enough sleep, time alone, time with people? Are you being intentional about movement and health? Like, do you find yourself just physically exhausted at the end of this year? What are the rhythms of renewal you need? Not just the rhythms of pushing pause, not just the rhythms of coping. Emotionally, we've all experienced trauma over the course of the last year. And my question for you is, where are you processing how you feel and what you've gone through? And if you're like so many, right, maybe your answer is, well, I've just kind of been like burying it and pretending it doesn't exist. That's probably a bad strategy. And so for us, maybe that's in a counseling room, like where are you going to start talking about what you're really feeling? Because technology maybe has allowed you to numb yourself to the point that you actually don't know how you're feeling is just showing up in unhealthy ways in your life. Relationally, who is in your relational core? Do you actually have people that you have let that close? Or has technology allowed you to keep everybody at arm's length and you've used filters to communicate a version of yourself that's quite different than you really are and the only person who knows it is you? And then lastly, spiritually, what is Jesus teaching you right now? If you're a follower of Jesus, we should always be listening and wanting to know, Jesus, what is it you wanna show me? What are some things in my life, God, that are out of step with the way that you're calling me to live my life? It's about keeping our hearts soft and sensitive to what he wants for us. Now, with all that, that's kind of a intro. We're gonna talk about these two 10 lists, right? 10 ways for you to win with technology and 10 ways for you to win as a family with technology. But I wanna set a couple of parameters up top. Um, th these are not like edicts, right? Like don't leave here and be like, well, Phil said we got to do these 20 things. That's a terrible idea. Don't do that um, because here's what'll happen. You'll do it for like a couple hours and then like an addict, you'll get the shakes and you'll go back to doing it exactly the way you were. And you'll be like, I can't believe Phil said that stupid stuff. And if you have a student or students that you have not had conversations like this with, you have like had unintentional use of technology in your home, do not go home and drop these down like the 10 commandments of technology from Eastern Hills. That is a terrible, terrible way to have this conversation. You need to start by apologizing. Apologizing that this conversation didn't start differently in your home earlier. Ask for their grace and their help in having the conversation. So, you ready? It's gonna make you uncomfortable. Number one. <laughs> Uh, use the screen time or digital well-being feature. It's called a screen time on iPhones. It's called digital well-being on Android. Uh, it will just allow you to see how you're using your phone. Actually, it happens to me on Sunday mornings. I get a little message and it's like my iPhone saying, hey, Phil, I want you to feel bad about yourself. And I'm like, <laughs> mission accomplished, right? Like that's, 
Uh, but it'll tell you where you're spending time. It will tell you what apps you most use. And I think that we have this perception in our head, like I don't really use it that much. And then you see that stuff and you're like, oh gosh, is that, are you sure that's my phone? Like, is that not my wife's phone? Like, no, 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 that's your phone, dummy. Uh, and so not about guilt, not about shame. It's just like, is that the story you want your life to tell about how you use technology? Screen time. Number two, use a bedtime or wake time feature for your phone. Um, you can set do not disturb to schedule. So like it, at a certain time at night, you stop getting notifications until a certain time in the morning. And if you're somebody that's like, what if there's an emergency, you can set it so that calls come through, calls from just people come through. Like you, you can set some parameters around that. Number three, give your tech a different bed than yours. <laughs> Um, so we know statistically that like a bunch of you are sleeping with your phone underneath your pillow. And like every time it buzzes, you're waking up. And I'm not like a sleep expert, but I don't think that's probably helping your sleep. Um, and so I would just say, whether it's that, whether it's like on your nightstand, this week I bought an alarm clock, like an action, they still sell them. Um, <laughs> Like put your phone somewhere else. Maybe it's the bathroom, maybe it's downstairs somewhere. Like get, here's, what I, here's the heart of it. I don't want, and I don't think Jesus wants the first thing you see in the morning and the last thing you see at night to be this. Just try it out. Again, you don't have to do any of these. I'm just a guy. I'm just telling you, maybe try something. Number four, use night shift. Your phone emits, actually all your screens emit a blue light that keeps you awake. It stimulates your brain. And so night shift will look a little different. The colors on your phone will look a little different, but what it's really doing is it's actually like letting your brain start to wind down and go to sleep. Try that out. Number five, turn off as many notifications as you possibly can. Remember those notifications we talked about last week around the statistics of the dopamine hits that come our way every time one of those notifications come, that you're being manipulated by notifications maybe more than anything else. I can get three types of notifications on my phone. One is if someone calls me, one if someone texts me, and one there's like a messaging platform we use as staff, that's it. Everything else I have to go get. And, and let me just tell you, if you have like hundreds or thousands of emails coming through and you're getting pinged in like a banner notification and a little bubble message and a lock screen and your watch shakes for every new message that comes in, like that strategy is not working for you anyway, right? Like you're not at inbox zero. So just turn that stuff off, be disciplined about checking it, but like let yourself live in the freedom of less notifications. Number six is gonna make you mad, delete social media apps. You're like, how many of them? <laughs> social media apps are the place that for the most part statistically we go to numb ourselves p.s they're also the place that comparison culture lives more than anywhere else so if you're like i can't do that okay well what if you could delete one and I'm not saying delete your social media account, like go check it out, like check it out on a computer, use the browser on your phone. But like that app is hardwired in your phone to do nothing but get you to keep looking at it. And we talked about this last week. We know that for students, the more they use social media, the more anxious and depressed they become. It is causative. And for adults, it, our brains may be slightly more developed, uh, but the only reason that we don't think that for us is because we get to set the rules. Like it's not good for us either. So delete them. If you can't do it all, start with a couple. Number seven, turn your phone to grayscale. Uh, in an iPhone, you do this under accessibility, uh, text display or something. I have had more conversations about this this week than anything else, like at least half a dozen times where people will look at my phone and they will be like, is your phone broken? Is there something wrong with your phone? And here's what I'll say. Um, I got this idea from uh, John Mark Comer's book, uh, Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And this is the idea behind it. What I want is when I'm having a conversation with someone and I'm tempted to look at my phone or get distracted or there's something happening in the world around me, here's what I want. I want when I see this to remember, this is fake, this is real. I wanna just keep letting transformation by the renewing of my mind happen, not conformity to a pattern of this world. This is fake, this is filtered, this is phony. And so how do I train myself? How do I retrain my brain to understand the difference between reality and fake? How do I help my phone be more tool than toy? So try that one out. 
I know some people that have tried it and are like, I can't do it, just something. <laughs> Number eight, YouTube restricted mode. Turn this on inside of YouTube on your phone and your devices. YouTube has a giant supercomputer pointed at your head, trying to take you to things that already agree with you in more and more extreme versions so that you will keep paying attention and they can keep making money off of you. But it's distorting your view of the world. And if you're not careful, it will take you into some really dark corners that you never wanted to go in the first place. Restricted mode can help in that problem. Number nine, give your spouse or a close friend full access to your phone. And I know this is uncomfortable given the considerable pause in the room, right? <laughs> and for some of you, you're like, well, here's the thing. If I let my friend or I let my spouse just see my phone, like there's some things on my phone I don't want them to know about. Doesn't that seem like maybe something you should talk about? And maybe the first person you're gonna to talk to about it is a counselor because the stuff that you're dealing with has been going on for a long time. It's, it's years, maybe it's decades of stuff that we're thinking about and wondering about as it relates to our habits and patterns around technology. But I hope that for you, you can kind of take a step back and go, okay, what is it that I'm so scared of? Am I tired yet of living this lie, of living this deception? Let somebody have full access to your phone. And then number 10, the 111 rule is what I've heard it called around how we take breaks from our phone. One hour a day, a meal works great. One day a week, where like you don't use your phone, ideally like try to not use technology at all. The Bible uses this term Sabbath, where we rest, where we have our rhythms renewed. And then one week a year, maybe a vacation, where you try to eliminate technology as much as you can. And it's, it'll be challenging at first, which should tell us that we need it, right? Um, but I think it's so important for you and me to take a step back and try it. I tried it for the first time last year. I was in um, uh, Montana for a, a week without any technology really. And it was like the most restful, restorative week of my 20 years in ministry. I'm just telling you, it's worth a shot. Um, now we're gonna talk about 10 ways to win with your technology as a parent. Uh, if you've not grabbed the discussion guide online or we have some physical copies in the back if you're here on campus with us, um, hopefully these are helpful. Again, if you have not had this conversation and you have a teenager, this is not like an imperative for you to take all these things and just drop rules on your kids this afternoon. These are conversation starters. Ideally, if you have little kids and like they don't have phones especially yet, hopefully these can be proactive conversations. Number one, slower and later is better. I know the pressure, I feel it. Like, well, my friends have this, my friends have that. You do not need to be the first parent in your kid's friend group to give them a phone. That is not loving, that is unintentional. And I know that for all of us, we feel like this pressure because of what phones can do for us. Let me just say this, while media is convincing us otherwise, the reality is statistically, we live in like one of the safest times and one of the safest places in human history safer than when I grew up. And you know how my mom notified me when it was time to come home at night? The streetlights came on. That's how I knew. It's like, oh, I gotta get home now, right? Now we're like wrapping our kids in bubble wrap. Like we just, they're going to the bathroom with helmets on. <laughs> and, and I'm not saying like, let's go back to the days where we just do nothing. No, no, I'm saying like, maybe there's a middle ground somewhere. And so when you decide to give it to them, they don't have to have every feature. They don't have to be the first one to get it. There's phones, there's one called the Gab phone, G-A-B-B. -B. There's a whole industry of them where uh, there are phones designed for you to give to your child that are more limited, that allow you as a parent to have greater restriction over. Uh, check that out. Number two, set up terms and conditions. Uh, we all have terms and conditions for stuff in our life uh, that we have not read. We've just clicked agree, right? But let me tell you a secret. As a parent, you will have no moment of greater control or influence in your child's life. No greater moment. Your Thanos moment. You control the universe the moment before you give your child a smartphone. And so like set up terms and conditions, have a conversation. What are the boundaries that for our home, for our child, technology is going to live within? Set those up. Number three, keep technology out of their room. Some of these are like, we know it, just nobody's like pushed us over the line to do it. Where do you think your child will get into more trouble on a piece of technology? In their room, late at night, by themselves with the door closed or downstairs in a public space that you can see? Keep them out of their rooms. Number four, put away devices an hour before they go to bed. 
Uh, we know that, that if we do this, we'll sleep better. We know that if our kids do this, we'll, they'll sleep better. We lie to ourselves about it. We're like, no, no, I just need to play a little bit more Candy Crush. That'll really help me fall asleep. <laughs> I'm gonna get in trouble for that reference, by the way, from my wife. Um, that's not actually gonna help you. Like it's not helping you sleep. Maybe you've trained yourself and it's become this Pavlovian thing, but like, it's not real. That's not actually helping you fall asleep. Put your devices away an hour before bed. And number five, use parental controls. Now, all the devices and technologies out there, you can go get all the individual parental controls for each of them, use them great. There's also a device that we've used for years that's extremely helpful called the Disney Circle. Um, I don't get paid by Disney to say this, I promise, uh, but it just allows you to categorize all the different devices by who uses them in your home, set different filter levels. Your whole home can have a filter level even if guests come. All the things exist the way you want them to. You can set time limits. It's super easy, check it out. Number six, set limits on games and apps. You can do it uh, inside of specific devices. This might not be something just for your kids. This might be something for you. This might be something you need to do. And you're like, but can I just enter my code and then override the limit? Yes. So have a friend or a loved one know the code and you don't. Tell them what the number or the restriction you want is and then live with that boundary in your life. It'll be healthy. Number seven, if you've liked me up to this point, kids, probably we're not Facebook friends here for a minute, but uh, number seven, read their text messages. Now, if you have not done this, you don't get to start doing it today without a conversation. This is not an underhanded sneak around thing. This is have a conversation. Here's why I say this. We know that the mental health crisis we're in the middle of right now is largely attributed to unintentional use of technology and cyberbullying that's taking place at a massive level. We hear about kids losing their lives every day from this. And I believe as parents, part of our responsibility is to be able to head some of that stuff off at the pass. Have the conversation, have a system that makes sense and builds trust with your kids and students. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, don't just take their word for it. Number eight, increase freedom for juniors and seniors. I always used to say high school is failure with a safety net. High school is the place where if you don't let your kids fail in high school, the problem you're gonna run into is that you like all of a sudden release them. And if you had the same guidelines for at eight that you did at 18, they will fail massively when they leave your home and there will be no safety net around them. So let go of the restrictions. Now it comes with every time we increase privilege, with it should come accountability and responsibility. So as we give a, give a phone to a kid, right? What's the accountability and responsibility that comes with that? As somebody moves out or starts to get ready to do that, what's the accountability and responsibility they're embracing for themselves in that? Number nine, you own the phone and can view anything. Don't let somebody buy your kid a phone. Don't let them get a hand-me-down. Be like, hey, I'm gonna buy you a phone. Uh, I'll pay for the plan. So glad to do it. But here's the thing. This is actually my phone that I'm letting you use. I can do anything with it that I want at any time. That is a parameter that will continue to allow you to put healthy boundaries around technology in your home so that technology can be more tool than toy. And then lastly, make this a consistent conversation. This is not a one and done thing. If you haven't had the conversation and you have a student that's like mid-teens and you're like, oh no, what have I done? Like start the conversation. Start honestly by realizing, you know what? I wish we would have. Cool, great. Ask for grace, ask for forgiveness. Your kids will so appreciate that from you. Because here's what I know. If you just drop these things in as edicts, as rules, as the 10 commandments, here's what I'll tell you. Rules without relationship always lead to rebellion. Always, always, always. And so if you just drop the hammer as mom and dad, as caretakers in the lives of your kids, you will not train them to love you and to see those boundaries as blessings or to see technology as tools. You will teach them to run faster and to hide better. Don't do that. Have the conversation. Because my heart is not just for our kids, but for us as adults, we would realize something. Over the last year, we have watched because of COVID way more places than maybe we'd seen before use gloves, and so like you walk into a restaurant maybe, or you see somebody traveling and they just have like the whole time they're wearing gloves all the time. And, and when you wear gloves, you, you instantly realize like you can't, like it restricts your movement. It's hard to like feel things through the gloves. It's an artificial experience. And what I want us to understand is that when we unintentionally use technology, it's like we're living life with a pair of gloves on. 
and we can't really feel like we're supposed to feel, and we can't really interact the way we're supposed to interact. If technology is this tool that's just consuming more and more and the patterns of this world are just taking us further and further away from what Jesus wants for us, my request is this, like, would you just try life with the gloves off for a little while? And yeah, it's, it's gonna be uncomfortable. It's gonna like trigger some stuff in us of like, oh no, I didn't realize this had taken up this much of my life, but I know it'll be messy. I know that there'll be hard conversations. I know that you'll have to like live in some awkward silences, but... What's on the other side of those? What's on the other side of really living? So these aren't go do all 20 of these things exactly like this, it's not what I'm saying, just conversation starters. The question that I would ask you is, what do you feel compelled to try in your life and home with technology? As you leave this place, as you turn this off and go back to your day, what do you feel compelled by God to try? In just a minute, we're gonna sing a song together and. Um, it's something such a great reminder about this because especially if we're living in regret as parents, like I wish there was some of this stuff that I had thought about before we'd ever introduced technology to our kids, but it's changed so fast, right? And so it feels intimidating. You feel like you're already behind the curve. And so this song is about a moment in Jewish history that we find in the Hebrew scriptures about how three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into a furnace for their faith. They were gonna be killed for believing. And when they looked in, they didn't see the three of them dying, they saw the three of them dancing. And actually it wasn't just three, there was a fourth one in there, it was God himself. And the reminder, especially if you're a follower of Jesus, is that you're not doing this alone. The spirit of God lives inside of you. And so these conversations and these boundaries and these adjustments to the way you think about technology and let people in, let God take back the primary role of steering your life. You're not doing it alone. Can I pray for you? God, I wanna lift up every person that's watching online, every person that's in this room. I know how ever present all this stuff is. I know how easy it is for this stuff to start taking over and taking control of our lives, mine included. And God, we don't wanna put the phones in the drawer. We don't wanna turn off the computers forever. We know the benefits that they bring, like we talked about last week, God, but we, we just wanna make sure we're using technology and it's not using us. We wanna make sure you're in charge not it. Would you help us to see that? As we sing these words and we're reminded of this battle we're in the middle of every day, would you remind us that we're not in it alone, that we don't need to surrender. The only person we surrender to, God, is you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're in the room with us, would you stand and sing?